Okay, good, good morning. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wanted to thank the organizers, but then I noticed that Roberto put me, uh, listed me as an organizer, so. <laughs> I want to thank my co-organizers. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is joint work with uh, Ruby Basu, who's here. Ruby, there, and uh, Jonathan Hermon, both students of Alan, who is here. And uh, so, this is uh, about the problem characterization of cutoff. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. There are you know plenty of experts here. Uh, so, okay, so, uh, <laughs> so first just the setup, we have a reversible Markov chain, P is a transition matrix, pi is a stationary distribution. Uh, we're going to focus on the reversible case and, uh, <laughs> and here we could work either in continuous time or with lazy chains, those are uh, equivalent. Um, and for concreteness, let's assume that chains are lazy. We need something to avoid periodicity issues. <laughs> okay, and um, our criterion for mixing, as usual, will be total variation distance. Uh, and D of T denotes the maximum total variation distance of the distribution at time T to pi. And here we're also maximizing over the initial state. Okay, so D of T measures from the worst starting point, how far are we at time T from the stationary distribution. Okay. And the epsilon mixing time is just the minimum time that ensures D of T will be less than epsilon. D of T is a monotone decreasing, weakly decreasing function of T. So once D of T is below epsilon, it will stay that way. And T mix, um, we have to fix some value less than a half for normalization. So just when we, I write T mix for T mix of a quarter. Okay, with this notation, um, chains exhibit cutoff if the T mix hardly depends on epsilon. In other words, T mix of epsilon and T mix of one minus epsilon are smaller order than the T mix itself. Okay, so that's uh, cutoff. And it can be also pictured in this graph. The graph of the D of T will start near one. So at time zero, the distance is close to one. And then it will, so when we have cutoff around this point T mix of the nth chain, we will have a very uh, rapid decay of D of T. And a little bit after time T mix, it will, the D of T will be uh, close to zero. So that's equivalent to this. And the cutoff window is the window around this where the most of the descent occurs. So formally, we say that WN is a, gives us a cutoff window. If, first of all, WN should be less low of T mix, and the difference T mix of epsilon, T mix one minus epsilon should be bounded by a constant times W. And this constant will have to depend on epsilon. Um, so that's definition with, uh, with some uh, cutoff window. So if you see in this definition, WN here is the, uh, really an upper bound for the, for the window. Okay, so this was first identified for random transpositions by Daikoni Shashahani and um, by Aldos for random walk on the hypercube. Many chains are believed to exhibit cutoff uh, and some spectacular successes have been uh, achieved recently by uh, Lubetsky and Sly for uh, easing models and um, by Hubert Lacroix for random adjacent transpositions, but there are many, many chains for which we don't know uh, cutoff and we suspect. Here's one of the simplest ones, random, random to random insertion. So you have N cards, you pick 
one uniformly at random, remove it, and put it back in another uniformly random, independent uniformly random location. Okay. How, how much simpler can, can we make a chain? Right? So if we take, if, <laughs> um, <laughs> right, so if the chain, if the, if we take the top card and insert in a random position, this is the famous top to random chain, which is also one of the earliest for which cutoff was established. But if we do random to random, it's suspected that cutoff happens at time three quarters log n, and this has recently be been proved to be a, a lower bound. So it's at least three quarters log n. But the upper bound is somewhere around two log n, so there's there's a gap there. So this illustrates very simple chains. We still don't know cutoff, but I'll tell you about some, some progress. Uh, so Aldous and Dicon, it's in their 86 uh, monthly paper, which is still worth ch checking out if you haven't seen it, say that this is the, you know, they state various open problems and they mention this is the most interesting one to find conditions for a cutoff that you can verify. Sorry? So, yes, yes, sorry. It's all, yes, yes. So I, I, uh, I switched the time scales. Yes, thank you. So, um, so when you do top to random, it's n log n. When you do random to random, it's uh, three quarters n log n is the, is the lower bound. Thank you. And it's believed to be sharp. Yeah, sorry for skipping the end. Okay, so some other notation we'll need is lambda two is the second eigenvalue. So first one is one, second one is lambda two. The spectral gap is one minus lambda two, and the relaxation time you've seen in Fabio's lecture yesterday is the inverse gap. Okay, in so ten years ago in a Workshop, I propose that the product condition should be a sufficient for cutoff in nice reversible chains. So product means the spectral gap times the t-mix should go to infinity. So we have a sequence of chains. And this is equivalent to saying the relaxation time should be negligible to the mixing time as n goes to infinity. So again, think of, we have a sequence of chains and we want the ratio of the relaxation time and the mixing time to go to zero or equivalently this product to go to infinity. And it's very, very easy to prove that this is a necessary condition for cutoff. You can find it, this just follows from looking at the second, at the second eigenfunction. Um, <coughs> and you can find the precise argument, for instance, in my book with Levin and Wilmer on mix Markov chains and mixing, but this is a very easy argument. So it's necessary for cutoff to have this, but uh, <coughs> already when I was starting to think about this, uh, David Aldous immediately uh, showed an example which show it's not always sufficient, and shortly thereafter, Igor Pak showed an example of a different type. And let me show you these examples because they kind of at least I'll show you the Aldous example, and I think you'll see it again in Hubert's talk tomorrow. Uh, so, maybe it's, uh, it's here. Yeah, so, so the open, because of these examples, we would like, and we know that the product condition is necessary, so cutoff, we would like to find some condition, additional condition, on top of the product condition, which together they'll be equivalent to cutoff. So that's kind of the goal. So I've been obsessed with this question since 2004 and basically have done, uh, you know, have uh, focused uh, on this uh, question and and it's still largely open. We have some, some progress, but the product, the conditions we have are still verifiable only in special cases. And in particular, they're not, we still can't decide the case of this random to random uh, insertion. 
Okay, so what's the Aldous example? Um, so, so here is, you know, this is a small variant of the version he wrote down. So let's, so here's a path of length 10n. And on this path, we're going to walk with probability two thirds to the right, one third to the left. But everything is later, uh, I'm describing a basic chain, then we're going to do this chain, uh, run a lazy version of this chain. But first I'll just write the original chain. So two thirds, one third. And the same happens here. So two thirds, uh, from every node we go two thirds, one third. But here we stay in place with probability a half and go to the right with probability, uh, well, one third, and to the left with probability one sixth. So this is kind of the lazy version of that, but then we're going to make the lazy version of the whole chain. So on the lower path, we're going to be doubly lazy. And here, at this juncture, we just go with probability half um, to, each of these, to each of these nodes. And if we want to make it irreducible, let's make it a quarter, a quarter, and, and one half back. Okay, so, and again, at this, at this node, you walk equally likely up or down. So I think I've now specified the transition from all the vertices. <laughs> and then you do the lazy version of this chain. So what you, if you calculate the stationary measure, you see that as you go from left to right here, it doubles every time. And, and it's, uh, it basically continues to double every time as you go along this path and as you go along this path. So almost all the stationary measure is at this node and a few neighbors around it. So if you want to achieve 99%, you just need a bounded small number of neighbors at this vertex and you'll achieve that. So because of that, it's very easy to see that the mixing time is essentially equivalent to the hitting time of this node from this node. And the total variation distance, so, so this d, uh, d of t or dn of t, is equivalent to the probability we still haven't reached the right-hand node. But how does this probability look like? It, isn't, it doesn't have a sharp cutoff because there's a dependence on what decision we made at this point. So we, <laughs> I mean, here on the lower part, we're slower but if we ignore this time change, the, we're equally likely to reach from the top or the bottom. So, so if we look at the graph of the total variation, it will, start, uh, it will start near one, then it will dip around 66n, right? Because for the original chain without the laziness, it takes you uh, 30n steps to reach here. You're moving at speed one third. Then uh, here we have, I didn't say, this is n nodes. So here we have another, uh, another, three, another three n. So this will be 33 on the top and 36 on the bottom. And then when you make it lazy, you have 66 n if you're taking the top route and 72 n if you're taking the bottom route. So, you ha so the total variation distance will dip at time 66 n um, to near <laughs> to near half, and then and then at time seventy two n will dip to dip to near zero. Okay, so this really precludes cutoff. So at any at, you know at, at times here where the total version distance is bounded away from zero and one, at times which are which where the ratio is not going to one. This is written up there. But if you look at this graph, it's, it's a weighted expander. So for <laughs> a, right, if you have a set of, of measure less than a half, then its boundary, again measured appropriately, is at least a constant times the, the size of the set. So this means the relaxation time of this is order one. So the relaxation time is order one. The mixing time is order n. So the product condition holds. 
yes, there is no cutoff. Okay, so <laughs> this is the. I guess this is the enemy here. Um, okay, so. So as we see in this example, the problem is that hitting times of a very large set, namely the, the right-hand vertex or its small neighborhood, these hitting times are not concentrated. We might hit from the bottom or the top, and that's kind of problem. And it turns out that once you remove this problem, then you can get cut off. So um, let me talk a little about hitting times. So already in the 80s, David Aldous found a relation between the mixing time and the maximal hitting time. Uh, he, he had that the mixing time was equivalent up to constant to the maximum over sets A of and starting points X of the measure of A times the hitting time of A. Okay, so this is already a very interesting result. But one drawback is you have no idea what is the size of the sets A in the maximum. So if these sets are tiny sets that you have to hit, then it doesn't give you so much information. There are so many tiny sets, if you have to maximize over all of them, then it's, uh, it's less useful, but still useful. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, I, asked for, for a while, is it true that, you know, 2007 or so, is it true that here you can focus on large sets, so sets where pi a, say, is bigger than a quarter? And if it's, of course, for sets where pi is bigger than a quarter, you can drop the term pi a, because it's just a constant, and we're just estimating up to constant. So the question is, if you restrict here to sets which are larger than a quarter, is the heating time equivalent to the mixing time? And that was actually proved independently by Roberto and by uh, Perla Susi and myself. Uh, so both papers have now appeared. And we actually proved it for sets which are uh, measure at least alpha, where alpha is less than, a, is strictly less than a half. And the case of alpha equal a half was settled later by Griffiths, Kang, Roberto and Patel. <laughs> so I just state these together. So also for, it's true also for alpha equal a half. So the mixing time is equivalent to the hitting time, th of alpha. th of alpha is the maximum over all starting points x and target sets a of the hitting time of a. Okay, so <laughs> in what we do in this work is refine this connection because all this was up to constant, so it's not really telling you cutoff. So we refine the connection so as to not to lose constants. And we also allow sets of measure bigger than a half, but here, you know, care is needed because as stated, it's not true for sets bigger than a half. So you need some condition to extend this equivalence to sets of measure bigger than a half. So let me say why this special threshold at the half. So consider the following chain. We have two cliques. So Kn is, is one clique, just a complete graph on n vertices. Here is another, another clique. Okay, and remember we're going to do lazy walk. So, um, so we're gonna have lazy walk on each cliques and they're connected by a single edge. Okay, so, so look at this graph. The first of all, <laughs> what, is the, what is the mixing time? The mixing time is just given by the time to cross from one side to the other. Because <laughs> so if you want to think of mixing in terms of coupling, if I have two particles, you know, if they're on the same side, then um, if I, you know, then they will, they will um, just, and I just run them, say, independently, they will, 
uh, hit each other within time n. But because each time they choose a random site, they might choose the same site and then they will couple. So within time n, they will, uh, they will couple. But if they're on different sides, then you actually have to cross from one side to the other in order to couple. There's no other way. And of course, before you have a chance to cross, then you're not mixed because there is this very substantial set that you have not, you, you have a low chance to visit. Now, how long does it take you before there's a reasonable chance to cross? So when you walk on KN, you visit this special vertex every n times. So the expected time until you, right? Each time you move to it with probability one over n. But even when you're at the special vertex, you don't necessarily cross because you have n minus one edges leading back and only one leading across. So even when you're at the special vertex, you only cross with probability one over n. So it will take you order n squared steps to cross from left to right. And indeed the mixing time here is order n squared and it is the maximal hitting time of a large set, namely say the right hand side from the left hand side, which is measure half. But now if suppose I take a set A of size bigger than a half, say even a set A of size 2n plus 1, I'm sorry, n plus 1, so pi of A is strictly bigger than a half. Again, they want to find what's the worst set. So I want to find the maximum hitting time of set of size n plus 1. So, um, so if a set is size n plus 1, it will have to contain, okay, the, the, the measure here is not uniform. So maybe let me just write pi A bigger than a half. So I have any set where pi A is strictly bigger than a half. What does that mean? It means it cannot be confined to one side. So say x is some starting point on the left. If pi of a is strictly bigger than a half, then a must have some representative over here, at least one, right? It cannot all be on this side. But if a has an element here, just to hit from x to this, to this element y, it takes me only time n, all right? So, so the hitting time, any set a, even tiny bit bigger than a half, the hitting time drops to order n instead of order, uh, instead of order n squared. And if a is really strictly bigger than a half, say at least 51%, then the hitting time becomes order one. So it really fails very badly the equivalence for mixing and hitting for sets bigger than a half. However, this chain is very special. The mixing time and relaxation time are really the same here. So one useful observation is or one useful result is that if you force the sets to have satisfied the product, force your chains to satisfy the product condition, so you assume that the mixing time and relaxation time are really different orders, then the equivalence for mixing and hitting extends to larger sets. It's one of the things we search. Indeed, you can go, you know, quite close to, to one. So as long as you're not too close to one, the, the gap is at least e to the minus t mix over t rel, then the equivalence of hitting times and mixing times still holds. Uh, okay. So, so really, the, this work was guided by several earlier works. One was the papers of Roberto and of uh, Perla and myself that I already mentioned on mixing and hitting. Another is work with the Jian Ding and Eyal Lubetsky on cutoff and earlier work of Diakonis and Kalofkos for birth and death chains. So for birth and death chains, what these papers, so Diakonis and Kalofkos handled the different distance, separation distance, which I won't go into, but then in the paper with Jian and Eyal, uh, we proved that for birth and death chains, so these are just chains so then we're always looking at lazy chains, but the basic chain is going to uh, go on a path and each time go left or right equally, I'm sorry, not equally likely, left or right with some probabilities that are place dependent. Okay, so if you're at uh, this point K, you go right with some probability PK, left with probability QK, and you're allowed also to stay in place with some probability RK. So that's the birth and death chain. 
And for bursting death chains, there's a lot of tools available. One of them is that hitting time from uh, the left node to some to any node in the middle can be written as a sum of geometric random variables, sum of independent geometric random variables. And it's, this representation is not obvious. So if you go, if you want to hit from left to, from this point to this point, um, you can obviously write it as a sum of independent variables, just go from zero to one, from one to two, and so on. That is a useful representation, but it's different from what I mentioned, because these hitting times are not geometric, and their tails are not uniform, and so on. But it turns out that there is a different representation, which is less geometric, but uh, also extremely useful, of this hitting time as a sum of geometrics. This was first discovered by Carlin and McGregor uh, in 1959, I think. And, and this representation, uh, the parameters of the geometric variables are just the eigenvalues of some restricted chain, and that is what allows to uh, make the connection. So, so one consequence of our results is that this now can be extended to nearest neighbor walks on trees, so not just paths. And we can also allow bounded jumps. So if you have even a, if you have a path and you go plus minus one and plus minus two with some probabilities, and I want the plus minus one to have a you know, non-zero probability, uh, bounded away from zero probability, then it's natural to expect that a chain like that, which is very local, is going to behave like a birth and death chain. And it's true, but it's not obvious because the ex exact representations we have for birth and death chains go away. So one needs more robust methods. But now we know this, uh, the results do extend to these chains, and even you could do bounded jumps on trees uh, to combine these two extensions and still get that the product condition is sharp. So, here is, um, so here is one result stated for trees. Again, it's derived from a result for general chains, but here is the specific corollary for trees. So the, the mixing time at epsilon and one minus epsilon are bounded by constant square root t rel t mix with a correction which is logarithmic in epsilon. Um, so for those who heard earlier versions of this lecture, this is an improvement over what was there, and this is already optimal with the root log. Um, so in other words, there is a cutoff with a window, which is the geometric mean of T-rel and T-mix. So note that because of the assumption, the product condition, T-mix is bigger order than T-rel, so this geometric mean is indeed negligible to T-mix. And, okay, and indeed, uh, what we showed in the, even for birth and death chains, the right dependence on the window, so it first, if you look at the most standard examples for cutoff, like the um, hypercube projected, so if you do random walk in the hypercube, but just keep track of how many ones you have, that's, the, you know, one of the most classical examples of cutoff. And that's a birth and death chain. And there, and in most examples of birth and death chain you'll first think of, the window is order of the relaxation time. But that's not always true, and we have examples of birth and death chains where the window is the geometric mean. And the dependence on, oops, and the dependence on epsilon is the square root log epsilon. So, and that's, I didn't write this down, but that's really the sharp dependence here. So not do better. In, in the earlier paper, even for birth and death chains, we got a weaker dependence on epsilon. But that wasn't the focus there. Okay, so it turns out that one key improvement is to treat hitting times a little more like mixing times. So the tradition in hitting times was to say, well, we have this random variable, but let's just pass to the expectation. 
but it turns out more useful to look at the tail. So, <laughs> so think of hit epsilon as a variant of T mix of epsilon. So, so hit alpha of epsilon, okay, what is it? It's the first time that ensures that all sets bigger than alpha will be hit with probability uh, at least one minus epsilon. So, the, so this is, takes a while to get used to, but I think people are used to T mix of epsilon, so you can think of this as a, as a relative of that. T mix of epsilon is how long do I have to run so that the total variation distance is less than epsilon. And here the question is how long do I have to run till the probability of not hitting a big set is less than epsilon. Okay. So, so pretty close. And, <laughs> and there's uh, some trivial uh, connection. So the tails, tails of hitting are bounded above by the tails of mixing. So, um, okay, so that's, that's an easy connection. But, but kind of the C, one observation is that, of course, to mix, the chain must first escape from, escape from tiny sets. But as I'll write down later, really one can decompose mixing for chains into two stages. One stage is you have to escape from tiny sets, and after that, the rest of the mixing is governed by the relaxation time. Okay, so there are versions of this in old theorems of uh, Salafkos that were more analytical, but here we'll be give a probabilistic version of this. Okay, so first stage is escape from tiny sets, then relaxation time governs the rest. So here is, so we have, so we have a lot of very specific inequalities. Uh, my co-authors are big fans of very sharp and detailed inequalities, and you can find these in the paper. Uh, here I'm going to state just one of these. So, um, so the, the T mix of epsilon is, has upper and lower bounds, which are hitting time. So here it's, so here is hit half. The sharper inequalities, which I will spare you, involve also delicately dealing with the size of target sets. But here I'm just going to uh, look at sets. So this inequality is not really enough for our purposes, but it's a start. So you see T mix of epsilon is bounded below by hit half of two epsilon and above by hit half of epsilon over two with corrections which depend on the relaxation time. So if you assume the product condition, then these corrections in blue are negligible. So then you see that the T mix of epsilon for any epsilon is controlled by hitting times. And, and so if these hitting times are all concentrated, then so will the mixing time. Now, to be honest, this inequality is not enough to deal with epsilon near one. So this inequality is good for epsilon near zero. You need other inequalities to deal with really the first stage of mixing. But it already gives you a flavor that, the, so cutoff really involves two things. One is behavior for when epsilon is large, so how you, is how D of T goes down from one, and one behavior uh, maybe the most interesting behavior is how you zoom in to the final uh, mixing, so when epsilon is near zero. And when epsilon is you know, near zero, less than, less than a quarter, then, oops, then this inequality already tells you that concentration of hitting times, uh, so if hitting times don't depend much on epsilon, then neither do mixing times. Okay, so that naturally suggests that we can define a cutoff for hitting by the difference between these hitting times should be little o of, of, itself, of the hitting time itself. And with that notation, we have the following equivalence. So cutoff in a sequence of Markov chains is equivalent to 
um, a combination of heat alpha cutoff, and here you can choose your favorite alpha. These are all equivalent. Together with the product conditions. So actually, I have to be careful. Heat alpha cutoff are not equivalent if I don't assume product condition, because if alpha is three quarters, you know, it's bad news. But if I assume the product condition, then heat alpha cutoffs are equivalent as we change alpha. And if we have the heat alpha cutoff and the product condition, then we get cutoff in the sense of mixing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you, still, you still need the product condition. Um, but, okay, the product condition is usually by far the easier, easier to verify, and we know it's always necessary. Um, So, so because we know that heating time is order of the mixing time, then most of this equivalence, we can kind of see it from the previous proposition, from this one, except for the behavior of epsilon near one. But for F behavior for epsilon near zero, we see here that if we have, uh, we, can, we see both directions. So if we have cutoff, we also must have Heating cutoff, and and we already know that cutoff implies the product condition. Okay, any questions about this? This is kind of the main general result. Now there's still a challenge to find more ap applications of this. So it's, I like it as an abstract result, but the question then becomes: Okay, which concrete change can I use this for? And still, heat alpha is still involved. You know some quantifier over the set. So we have to find which sets are hardest to hit. Okay, so this is still, still a challenge. Now when you have some tree structure or crossing tree structure, you can identify these sets. Now, uh, okay, so in the remaining time we want to, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about how for trees, so for trees, we can, in this theorem, just show that the um, heat alpha cutoff follows from the product condition, so we have the clean equivalence of cutoff to the product condition. Okay, and I'll show you that. But let me first give some indication of what is the, you know, some key ingredients in the proof. I don't have time to give you the whole proof, but it is on the archive. So, so a key ingredient is uh, something that is extremely useful and I think hasn't been used in our community before, which is the uh, star maximal inequality and the related sign maximal inequality for Markov chains. So uh, people who have studied ergodic theory uh, you know, know this, uh, <laughs> the maximal ergodic theorem. And this is a relative of that, but it has, it doesn't involve Cesaro averaging over time, uh, which you see in the classical maximal, you know, Wiener or Hopf maximal ergodic theorem. So, okay, so we call the usual notation. So PTF is just the expectation of F of XT, just multiplying F by the matrix T to the T from the left. And, uh, Again, e pi of f is what you think it is. And, uh, okay, and then we have the variance with respect to pi of a function. So one standard thing, this is just, this is not the, this is the thing we use all the time, that if you take p to the tf, this shrinks the variance by a factor of the, you know, e to the minus twice t over t rel. This is just really from, you know, the, diagonalization of T, reversibility and diagonalization. Okay, so this is a standard contraction lemma. Um, <laughs> so 
So here I could write, you know, lambda more precisely than this, I could just write lambda two to the power of CT is what comes in, in here. Okay. But here is the interesting ingredient. Um, so this uh, maximal inequality, which is due to star in 66 and refines an earlier inequality of Stein. Now, uh, Stein's proof is really dazzling. It combines the maximal ergodic theorem with the spectral theorem in a beautiful way. It's like a two-page beautiful calculation. But it, uh, it turns out that Starr's approach, which is based on reduction to martingales, gives more precise results. Now, Starr's paper is 30 pages, but this is because he had to write a thesis. Uh, it turns out that the core of the proof is, it can be done in a few lines. Um, and it's, it's very nice. So I'll, I'll get you to where this comes from. So here is the inequality. So we start with a function f on the safe space. We find the maximal function to be, uh, right? So we just maximize p to the kf of x over all k. Then f star, the norm of f, the LP norm, in this work, c equals 2 is good enough for us, but uh, in other places, one needs uh, different values of p. The uh, LP norm of f star is bounded by q times the LP norm of f. So I have the factor 2 here, which is not really optimal. The really, the optimal inequality is to just use even times, and then you don't have this 2. And then from that, one can deduce, easily deduce this by taking odd and even times separately. Anyway, the exact value of the constant won't be important for us here, but it is important in other places, so I do want to mention that. So what's important for us here is just that this maximal function, which has a maximum over all k, can be controlled, its norm can be controlled by the maximum, by the norm of f itself. Now, of course, for each individual k, we know this is just a contraction lemma, but the point is that it's true with this maximum. And Okay, now if you see this, this should remind you of uh, the Dub maximal inequality. Dub LP maximal inequality has a similar form. And indeed, this is derived from the Dub inequality. Let me sketch for you why. Uh, so let's write P to the two, uh, so let's look at even time. And let's write P to the 2N of F. So we're going to be interested in P to N F at, uh, at the point x0. Right, so we can write this as, so this is expectation f of x to n when you start from x0, so given x0. And, and we can write this, so let's condition on, on xn. Okay, so it's just the expectation is the expectation of the conditional expectation. So what's in, inside here, let's call it R, Rn. So Rn is the expectation of f x two n given xn, conditional on xn. So this is some random variable. And <laughs> and the key is when you condition on xn, then because of reversibility, x2n and x0 have the same distribution. So Rn, which is defined as f of x2n given xn, it's actually the same as the expectation of f of x0 given xn. Now you have to be careful with the notation here because if you just insert back, you'll get something very confusing. But just think of Rn by itself. It's this expectation which has the same, so this is some function of Xn, right? And this is function of Xn is the same as this function of Xn. All right? But now, if I condition on Xn, because of the Markov property, the distribution of X0 given Xn is the same as the distribution if I condition on the whole path X, 
from n to infinity. Okay, so this is xn, xn plus one, and so on. If I condition on the rest of the path, it doesn't affect the law of x0. Uh, this is just the sigma conditioning here. It's just the sigma field generated by xn, xn plus one, and so on. So now I'm looking at f of x0, conditioning on this sigma field. Now this is a decreasing sequence of sigma fields. In other words, we have a reverse martingale here. We have one random variable, fx0, and we can x0 is going to be fixed according to phi. And <laughs> so it will be a stationary chain, uh, but we're conditioning it on a decreasing sequence of fi sigma fields. So then, uh, so I use the notation R because it's a reverse martingale. And then Dube's maximal inequality tells you that uh, if I take the maximum over N of Rn, then if I have a martingale, then the LP norm is controlled by Q times the norm of the last element. If I have a reverse martingale, it's controlled by Q times the norm of the first element. And R0 is just F. Okay, so this is the norm of the max of Rn, and then we, what we need is the norm of this, which is a conditional expectation of R to N. And, and now you just need that the uh, expectation, the maximum of expectation is bounded by the expectation of a max, and you need the fact that conditional expectation reduces LP norm. So these are two, two facts you need. So maximum of expectation is less than expectation of maxima of anything. And you need that uh, the, L, the LP norm is of, of a conditional expectation is less than the LP norm of the original variable. And if you combine these ingredients with the uh, argument I showed you, you immediately get this inequality, again, just for even times and with a Q instead of a, the two, okay? And if you want, this is spelled out in more detail in, a <laughs> in our paper. And if you really want, you can look in Starr's original paper to find this well hidden within 30 pages of argument, yes. Ah, this, this two is a, the two is a typo there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, there's no two here. Yeah, I don't know why that is a remnant. Sorry about that. P, what? P is between one and infinity, but it's not. So it's strictly bigger than one, strictly less than infinity. What? Ah, yeah, sorry. So I think there's one last uh, checking that was uh, missed. So P is between one and infinity, thank you. And, and here there is no two, sorry about that. Thanks. Okay, any other comments? Okay, so let's see how this gets used. We're getting, so let the uh, GS be the set of, okay, this will be an event, which is a good set for A after time S. So let me say what this means. GS AM is the set of starting points G, so that the probability of A is close to pi of A, not just the time S, but for all times after S. So this is, now how close do we want it? We want it M sigma S. So remember, sigma S is, uh, we, well, we write E to the minus S over T rel, but this is an upper bound for the standard deviation of PS of the indicator of A. Okay, so think of this, this is a set of points which are good starting points 
at time, after time s for the set A. In other words, if you start at these points and examine the probability of being in A at time s or later, at any time, the probability is very close to phi A within M standard deviation. Okay, that's formally that's the definition. And the, <laughs> and the okay, since we want we want this m sigma s to be epsilon, then it tells us what time we should take. S should be T rel times the log of m over epsilon to make this, this quantity less than epsilon. Okay, and the key fact is that this set G, I abbreviate it as G, has measure bigger than one minus eight over m squared. And this just follows from using the correct function in the star maximal inequality. So, um, so it's very easy to verify, maybe not you know, at the minute you're watching, but uh, that if you set Fs to be the P to the S of this indicator of A minus S expectation, then the complement of G is just the set where, or is contained in the set when f s star, this maximal function, is bigger than m times the norm of f s. So this norm is just the standard deviation. And once you know that, you just apply star's inequality to get this. this. So the set, of, the, se the set of good starting points is large. You know, if you, take, if you take m large, then this is going to be close to But uh, as you see, M doesn't have to be very large. So, you know, all right. So this is kind of the last of these calculations that I will show. So oops. Um, so this is the inequality we get. T mix of two epsilon can be bounded by, a, it's a combination of two factors. So here is the tail of the hitting time at this number. And then another, uh, another term, which is the relaxation time times log m over epsilon. So this justifies the claim I made earlier that mixing can be composed into two periods. One is hitting of a very large set. So think of, you know, think of m as 100. And this is a set of measure very close to one that we want to hit. So it's really more appropriate to think of it as escaping from a tiny set, which is the complement of the set. We want to escape from some tiny set, the worst, the hardest to escape tiny set. And then we want to, uh, and then we just need the relaxation time multiplied by this factor that depends on M. M I just took to be a constant and, and the epsilon. So it's, these are the two terms. And the proof is just follows from what we've discussed. If G is the set of good, uh, of good times and S of good starting points and S is, as I wrote before, T rel times log M over epsilon, T is this hitting time, then pi of G is at least one minus S over M squared, which just means that the, by the definition of this T, the probability that TG is, the probability of TG bigger than T is going to be less than epsilon. Because T, by time T, I'm ensured to hit every large, se every set which is so large. So when we define a set of good starting points, okay, this, uh, this set is large by uh, star's inequality. And then because it's large, I know that I will hit it by this hitting time because this is a hitting time that ensures I will hit every, lar every such large set. So this, basically completes the proof, but here is another way to look at it. The, if I look at the total variation distance at time t plus s, okay, so this is px t plus s a minus phi a. I can decompose this difference into, so this, I can, can decompose this into two probabilities. One is the, one is the event that I haven't hit this large set, okay? 
but this we know is unlikely by because G is large. And then another possibility is that I've hit this large set, but somehow my distribution is still far from pi. But if I've hit this large set, then I can use that, you know, with use the Markov property to consider the probabilities from that time until time t. The thing is, because I've hit the large set, I don't have good control of when I hit the large set. If I did hit it before time t, I don't know exactly when. So the remaining time is not exactly s. The remaining time is something bigger than s. So here is where the usefulness of stars inequality comes in, that, the, that I can restart at the hitting time of g and not worry about is the remaining time I have exactly s. As long as it's something bigger than s, then star ensures me that I'm going to be close to the stationary distribution. So this is, so the second term here is the probability. So, so if, right, so this first term corresponds to not hitting G. The second term corresponds to hitting G, but still not being mixed. But if, if, if I hit G, then I use the Markov property to consider the probability from where I am to hit, to be in A at time T. But there is another piece of data, which is what is the time? But the remaining time is not exactly S, but something bigger than S, so that's what's controlled by the star inequality. Okay. Um, so finally, I'm out of time to really give the derivation for trees, uh, but I'll just say in one, one word that for trees, the key is that we can recognize every tree has a central vertex. So a vertex is called central if when you remove it, all components that result have stationary measure at most one half. Okay? There always is a central vertex and there are on any tree and there are at most two. It's a very easy combinatoric exercise. So, <laughs> and uh, if you have a central vertex and you have any starting point X, then the set that is hiding behind the central vertex has to have measure at least a half. And it turns out these are the sets, these are the hardest sets to hit. And this is some, because of the tree structure, uh, one can prove that and then use the, because we know what these sets are, then we can use the previous criterion and uh, we can understand that the uh, hitting time of these sets is concentrated uh, because the variance of the hitting time is controlled in terms of the relaxation time of the big chain. So I don't have time to go into this. Um, so I'm going to skip this proof. Okay, so um, so I've used lazy chains here. One extension is uh, in order to get rid of periodicity, of course, it's well known that you can use uh, continuous time as well. In fact, you know, many papers of Aldos and also of Roberto were in the continuous time setting. But uh, in fact, you can, uh, all you need is to average two consecutive times. So again, in my paper with uh, Perla Susti, we proved this in the sense that up to constant, the mixing time and the relaxation time, I'm sorry, the mixing time is the same of the lazy chain and of this average chain on two times. But now we understand this in the refined sense of cutoff, and that proves another conjecture of Aldos. Um, okay, as they talked about birth and death chains, previously the birth and death assumption was used due to this representation of hitting times, but now we can relax it to allow jumps, a, a path with jumps, or even a tree with jumps. Okay, so, so 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 I'm finishing with the, some questions. What so what can be said about the geometry of the worst sets? So I think that's one general sense. The sets that are hardest to hit. How do they look like in specific chains of interest? So we know what they look like in trees, but what do they look like in the easing model? What do they look like in uh, various chains on the permutation group. I expect they should have a nice structure, which 
we should be able to understand and then get cut off from that. In particular, you know, one belief we have, which we haven't been able to justify, is that the, uh, some of the results of Lubetsky and Sly on eating model could be maybe uh, re-derived from this point of view, and maybe then one could extend to, uh, to other spin systems. Um, okay, thanks for your attention.